Good evening and welcome to the first Science at Melbourne Dean's Lecture for 2023. My name is Professor Moira O'Brien and I have the privilege of being the Dean of the Faculty of Science here at the University of Melbourne. And I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we are on today. They are the Wurundjeri people and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been the custodians of the lands and the waterways of Australia for thousands of years. I acknowledge and respect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as this country's first scientists with deep and enduring knowledge of the land, waters and skies. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present and I particularly welcome any First Nations people here today. Our Dean's Lecture Series is an annual calendar of events that proudly shares our faculty's knowledge and curiosity, engages audiences in current research and empowers the community to ask questions and to take action to better, for a better world. There will be three additional public lectures that will be hosted as part of this series throughout the year, covering exciting scientific research topics, discoveries and theories and we hope that you will join with us for all of them. So please note that this lecture will be recorded for those who are unable to join us tonight, and it will be available online shortly through the Faculty of Science website. And we will also email everyone showing you where, how to find it um, for anyone who is registered. Also, after the event, we encourage you all to stay for refreshments and some nibbles in the foyer and, and have a chat. So tonight's conversation will be a vibrant and illuminating one. A conversation <laughs> that addresses colour, light and energy. So often when we think about colour, we think about pigments and dyes. But some of the most vibrantly coloured creatures in the animal kingdom don't owe their amazing colour to pigment. Instead, they cover themselves with microscopic structures that fine tune the way light is reflected. And when it comes to light and colour, so the reason our phones light up or the reason that animals like fireflies can produce light, it's all about energy. And our panel of experts will open your eyes to how energy is hidden in colours and how we can draw on biology as a source of inspiration. You'll also have the opportunity for a question and answer session, so have your questions ready when we get to that stage of the night. So tonight's panel we, consists of three excellent academics. First is Amanda Franklin from our School of Biosciences. We have Dr James Hutchison from our School of Chemistry. And we have Professor Anne Roberts from our School of Physics. And we're also thrilled to have Associate Professor Jen Martin with us this evening from our School of Biosciences, who will take the reins as moderator. Jen has worked, worked as a field ecologist for many years until she decided to switch to her other passion, which is science communication. She's now doing that full time. Jen founded and leads the University of Melbourne's acclaimed science communication teaching program. She also practices what she preaches and for more than 18 years, Jen has been talking about science each week on 3RRR radio. She writes a variety of her publications, she hosts podcasts, and she's the MC at many events. Jen was named the 2019 Unsung Hero of Australian Science Communication and is an ambassador for the Wilderness Society's Nature Book Week. Added to this, her first popular science week, Why Am I Like This? The Science Behind Your Weirdest Thoughts and Habits was published last year. On top of this, Jen also sings as, sopra as a soprano in a wonderful women's choir. We are indeed very lucky to have Jen working with us and that she has agreed to moderate tonight's talk. With pleasure, I now hand over to Jen. Thank you, Moira, and good evening, everybody. So, why is the sky blue? How are rainbows made? How do solar panels work? And why on earth are some animals so brightly coloured? These were just a few of the questions that my kids used to ask me when I was little, and often I don't think I had particularly good answers for them. I am a biologist, but I'm definitely not a physicist. Um, so I'm really thrilled that we have these three amazing experts with us this evening to help us all learn a lot more and understand a lot more about the relationships between light 
and colour and energy. Things that I just think are utterly thrilling and I hope that you are all as excited as I am to learn a little bit more. So it's a delight to introduce a little bit further our three speakers to you, Amanda, Anne and James, but I'm not going to introduce you to them in lots of detail because they have so many accolades to their name that if I introduced them properly, we'd be here all night and we wouldn't have any time for the fun stuff. So trust me, they're amazing and you can read all about them uh, on our website. So Dr. Amanda Franklin is a Melbourne postdoctoral fellow here in the School of Biosciences and she's interested in animal visual systems and animal colour patterns. So you can tell why we want to have her here this evening. Um, she's also worked at the Victorian EPA, the Environment Protection Authority, as a data scientist, and she completed her PhD as a Fulbright Science and Technology Fellow at Tufts University in Boston. Um, Amanda also plays field hockey, and her favourite food is buffalo wings. And I really want to know if that was pre-Boston or post-Boston. Post. Post-Boston, post <laughs> post OK. I thought that was probably fairly likely. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Amanda. As you heard, Professor Anne Roberts is a professor here in the School of Physics and she's got really diverse research interests in physical optics and some of the applications of her work include the development of new approaches to imaging and microscopy. And Anne was awarded the 2020 Alan Walsh Medal for Service to Industry by the Australian Institute of Physics. Now, since we're talking about colour today, it's very important you know that Anne's favourite colour is slate blue, which I have on good authority is very similar to Monday blue, if you look at the Dulux paint atlas. <laughs> um, and thanks so much, Anne. I managed to procrastinate for at least half an hour looking at the Dulux paint atlas this afternoon. Who knew it was such a wealth of excitement looking at all these colours and what they're called? So welcome, Anne. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. James Hutchinson is a senior lecturer also in the School of Physics, but he's actually a chemist. So we're going to have to... Well, sc school of Chemistry. Oh, why do I have that you were in the School of Physics? That makes no sense. You're a physical chemist though, right? Physical chemistry. Exactly. Okay, that's where, that's where I went wrong. So his research interests are in light to chemical energy conversion. And he's a chief investigator with the ARC Centre for Excellence, or Centre of Excellence, sorry, in exciton science. And uh, James gave me permission to share with you that in first year chemistry, he got 52 out of 100. That's terrible. But he's still a chemist. <laughs> and you're about to hear about his immense passion for this area. So thank you to all of you. I'm very excited to be here with you. So when the four of us first got together with the faculty team to talk about how we might run this session tonight, it immediately became apparent that these guys could talk for about, I don't know, 1,500 hours about colour and light um, and energy and how exciting it would be. But we realised very quickly that we wanted this conversation to be based around some images because, of course, when we're thinking about light and colour, images are really amazing. So we have some images to share with you and our wonderful experts are going to tell you some of the things they know about these beautiful images. Um, I am going to promise to do my very best to leave some time for your questions, so please think about questions as we go. And uh, let's get started. So I think we're going to dim the lights a little bit so you can see our image as well. You don't need to see our lovely faces anymore, but you do need to see the pictures. So what a stunning image to begin with. I'm guessing it may take some of us back to our childhoods of looking for amazing beetles, Christmas beetles. But Amanda, tell us, what, what are we looking at? What is this incredible picture? So this is a picture of beetles pinned in a museum. And I wanted to show you this picture because I've come from a marine background and so when I started working on beetles it was this, these kind of images that got me really excited just because it shows how diverse and weird and bright and colourful they are. But also they, these colours are maybe not, they may not function as you think, other animals won't see them as we see them. Um, they're very bright so you may think it would attract attention or be used for communication but it could be uh, to avoid predators and to hide, or it could be something completely non-visual. It could be for thermoregulation. Uh, so it, the image to me kind of brings up that not everything is as it seems and that there's a whole other world that we can't see, um, and that's what animals see. And Amanda, do we know if these beetles see these colours in each other? Not really. We have 
some idea. So we know that some beetles can probably see colour, but most beetles probably can't see colour. So most of them won't be able to see these brilliant colours um, of each other. What a shame. Yeah. How sad for yeah. the beetles. <laughs> um, so is it meant for the, the predators? We don't really know, plant, but there's a, a lot of... Um, there's new studies now starting to show that some of these colours actually help these beetles avoid predators. Um, and they actually, so some of the really iridescent ones, uh, like the one right in the middle, the green one with red tips, beetles like that have been shown that they actually camouflage more in a natural habitat than, um, than other beetles that are not changeable in colour. So like uh, a matte coloured beetle would be more obvious than these iridescent changeable beetles, which is the complete opposite of what you would think when you look at a picture like this. Just a tip for everyone, if you're chatting with Amanda later over a drink in the foyer, make sure you check out her earrings. You'll know why I'm saying that after this picture. Um, so do we know how the beetles produce these colours? So Maura said in her introduction, you know, we tend to think pigments and dyes, but that's not what's going on. And I know you all have expertise in this area. Like, how do they look like that? Yeah, so there's, there's a mix. So the, some of the oranges up there, like the one in the bottom, uh, right, that orangey colour is probably due to pigments. It, um, it may be a combination of pigments and structures, but definitely pigments. But a lot of these other really bright, dazzling colours are just nanostructures in the cuticle. So there's different ways these nanostructures can be um, organised and then they interact with light and reflect some colours and not others and at different angles. Um, so there's a mix of both pigments and structural colours in these beetles. And as the physicist, was that a good explanation? Yes, <laughs> it's an excellent explanation. And we can also see structural colours in, it's not just beetles, but um, butterflies, birds and plants and plants, other creatures yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, marine creatures, yep. yeah, crustaceans, yeah, jellyfish even yeah. sometimes. Yep. Yeah, so, um, so that, yeah, so, I mean, when we see some of these bright colours, it sort of brings it back to thinking about light being a wave. And if we're thinking about structural colours and um, the, the dimensions of the, um, of the material or the patterns or the structures that the light's interacting with tend to be smaller than the wavelength of the light that, it, um, that, that it's interacting with that produces that actual colour. And so I think in, in some of these beetles, um, we see um, a lot of layered types of structures and the typical spacings are of the order of 100 nanometres or something like that. And if you think about 100 nanometres, 100 nanometres is, is very small. A nanometre is a billionth of a metre. Um, and, um, you know, it's much, much smaller than a human hair, for example. So we're talking about really, really fine features that are interacting with light in this way. And actually, this might be, I want to talk about a different type of structural colour. In fact, a human-made example structural colours. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> pop to the next one and we might come back to maybe how this, how this might relate to the, the beetle um, mm -hmm. colour. But this is, I, I love this picture so I was very keen to um, include this and this is um, called the Lycurgus cup. It is an example of um, ancient Roman technology and I should point out that the, the glass that you can see, this is two images of exactly the same cup it's just been illuminated in a different way. Um, so the, the, the relevant thing I want you to look at is the actual glass with the um, uh, you know, uh, images of people on it, the carved people. The um, silver gilt base and the rim are actually 18th and 19th century or 18th or 19th century, but the glass itself is believed to be about 4th century. And um, the history of it is a little bit, um, un, you know, people don't know exactly where it came from, but it's believed to have been made in, uh, in Rome. And um, so it was made using, um, I guess, traditional glass making um, approaches. And um, what's really interesting about this is it looks quite different to what you might think of when you consider a coloured glass. If you look at coloured glass, um, generally you're looking at light coming through it and it will be a certain colour due to a, a pigment that's been included into the glass itself. But here we're clearly seeing that on the, the left-hand side where you're seeing the glass being viewed in uh, reflected light, it looks greenish. 
Whereas if a light is put inside the light or behind it, it looks red. And in fact, I was absolutely delighted to see this in the British Museum a few years ago. And the way they've got it um, exhibited is they've got a light sitting inside it that is going on and off and on and off. So you can clearly see that um, colour variation, which is known as dichroism. So this is clearly not see something you see in a conventional type of glass. And in, I think it was the 1990s, they were able to examine um, uh, using you know, X-ray techniques and uh, electron microscopy what was actually in this glass. And what they found was that the, the glass was um, full of these uh, nanoparticles. They were about 70 nanometers or so in diameter and they consisted of a gold-silver alloy. <laughs> And what they do is that they um, interact with light in a way that uh, at a certain wavelength that's typically in the sort of greenish part of the spectrum, you tend to get enhanced uh, scattering and also absorption. So when you're looking at the glass in reflection, you get that kind of greenish hue from that, that backscattering. But when you're looking at um, light going through the glass, you are seeing a red colour because the, the green and the shorter wavelengths have been removed from the white light that's uh, illuminating it. So it's these um, nanoparticles that are actually producing um, this particular coloration. So this is an example of uh, human-made structural colour. So this relies on nanoparticles, but if we come back to the, the insect world, there are a range of different nanostructures that will actually produce characteristic coloration. So I think in the beetles, it's primarily a, a layering, but I think in uh, butterflies, you also see gyroid type yes, features. Yes, really interesting, weird structures. And it's, even if there's slight changes in the structure, they can produce very different um, colors and visual effects. Um, another interesting one in the beetles um, with weevils is they have um, 3D photonic crystals and in them, there's like little spheres, tiny, tiny little spheres that are all stacked on top of each other. Uh, but if you Google these weevils, um, they look like someone stuck glitter on them. They, <laughs> the first time I saw one, I thought someone had stuck glitter on it. So it didn't look real, but they can produce all these weird and dazzling effects. And so that's different to the multi-layers, which was the layered, um, the layers of cuticle. Uh, and then there's diffraction gratings as well, which is like ridges on top of the cuticle, and that kind of produces a rainbow effect, uh, like an oil, an oil slick. Um, yes, there's lots of different structures that can be used. Yeah, yeah, and what I find very exciting as well is when you have combinations of pigment, that pigmentous colour, so of the kind of molecular dyes that we have in our clothes, and this so-called structural colour where you have um, these microscopic or even nanoscopic layered um, structures in the material um, because from a research perspective that's that's a fantastic what we call um, bio inspiration so so take you know taking ideas from nature that can help us um, find mm. some you know solutions to our problems and that that combination of pigment and, and nanostructured material is is what we, we are trying to develop more and more in our light emitting devices in our solar cells um, to make them more efficient so we're, we're always well, one of my areas of research, and this is actually in collaboration with, with Anne, is to develop um, alternatives to silicon solar cells, for example. So, so you're using organic materials, which are lighter, more flexible, have so many benefits. Um, so if we can take inspiration from nature, which has these very strongly um, absorbing or strongly colorful <coughs> molecules, as well as these um, nanostructures, which, which kind of can trap the light into the device, then we can make much more, hopefully make strong, better solar cells and better light emitting devices. So James, if we're talking bio-inspiration, shall we look at the next slide and have a look at some uh, light in nature? Oh yes, yeah, sure, let's go ahead. Let's All right, so yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Tell us, <laughs> what's going on? Oh, Jellyfish, coral, yeah, what's, so the, where's this light coming from? So the, the star of this story indeed is that, that jellyfish up there that's glowing greenly and it's, it's found off the, the coast of Washington State in the US, I believe. I think so, yeah. yeah around yeah. there. And you can see even though it's, it's, it's deep in the, in the dark ocean there, it's, it's glowing green. Uh, and, and so we'll come, to the, uh, we'll come to the story of how it's actually getting the energy to, to glow like that. But it's, a, it's also a, a fascinating um, chemistry story. Or maybe you can tell us about the serendipitous yeah, discovery so first. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really cool story. I really like it because it shows that you cannot always plan um, what goes on in science. Uh, but they were trying to extract and work out how this jellyfish was luminant and what it was actually doing and how we could maybe make that happen ourselves. 
and the scientists had been working on it for a really long time with all these different chemicals, it just wasn't working how he wanted, he couldn't get it to glow. And at the end of one night, he just put everything in the sink and went to turn the light <laughs> off and was just like, I'll just clean it in the morning. And he turned the light off and the sink was glowing and he's like, <laughs> something's happening and it's working now. And what he realised was there was an out, there was seawater flowing into the sink and um, so he knew that seawater was required to make it glow and then they could start to work out how, um, how it glows and eventually they got a Nobel Prize for this but it was all from just an accident of throw, not cleaning up his his glassware before he went home. I feel like there's a message in that for all of us. Yeah. Don't clean up after yourself and you too could get a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Our labs look like that. Yeah. <laughs> We've tried that. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's also, I think, a, a, a beautiful story of self-assembly. So, so what's making that jellyfish fluorescent is a, is a fluorescent protein. You can see the structure in, in the middle there. Um, and it, it starts out as a, just a strand um, where the units are made up of, of molecules called amino acids. Um, and it just self-assembles in, spontaneously in this, in this um, jellyfish uh, and folds up, synthesizes a molecule that, that is the fluorescing molecule in the system. And then it, you can see there, it, it, it then makes a helical structure that forms a barrel around that molecule. There's two other helixes that sit on top, uh, above and below. So what you get um, purely self-assembled there inside that jellyfish is that, that kind of tin can structure. It's about four nanometers high and about a couple of nanometers across. So, um, and so it's a beautiful example. And, and I wanted to add that that tin can makes that, is kind of has a really nice protective um, function of that molecule. So that, that particular chrome, that fluorophore, that fluorescing molecule is highly stable and, and really bright and, you know, as competitive as, as any synthetic um, fluorescent molecule that we can synthesise. So. I'm guessing that means we've put it to good use if it's stable? We, we sure have. So, yeah, so as I said, it's a beautiful story of chemistry, but it's really revolutionised biology. So because what, what's also really useful about this protein is once you work out the code to express that um, protein, um, you can tra transfect it um, into other animals. And you can see on the, on the right there, you can then make any any animal just naturally um, grow up um, such that it's fluorescent green. So that's really, really important when you're doing bioimaging. Bio so you want to, under a microscope, you want to see a particular part of the cell at really high contrast. Well, you can code for it to express a green fluorescent protein or that red fluorescent protein from that coral there. And so you can get um, beautiful, beautiful colours. That's a really scary looking Easter bunny. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> fluorescent green. And can I add one more fun fact? Of course, so, we're here for the fun facts. <laughs> so apparently under, under, under our skin, we have a, or in high, in high concentration, it's just underneath uh, the top layers of our skin, we have a protein called nitrogen, which apparently its sequence or its folding is almost exactly the same as green fluorescent protein. So it has that, that tin can-like structure. And apparently if we just had three or four mutations of our, of our nitrogen protein, we would also start um, fluorescing green. <laughs> so it's, uh, apparently it's possible that, you know, in the distant past or maybe in, 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 in the distant future, we may, we may have our own colour. <laughs> Surely <laughs> there's a movie lessons. plot in that, right? <laughs> yeah. Surely. There's um, several animals people have found recently, I think a wombat maybe, and platypus, whereas you shine the UV light on them in a museum, they'll fluoresce, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really have a function. It's, it's just like there's, they're not getting in the wild, they're not having UV light shone on them. But I wonder if that's got any relation to there's some, some chemical that similar to that one maybe or something else yeah. that's just a couple of mutations and that's why it happens, but it just oh. has no function. I think it would just transform going to a nightclub, is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should we have a look at some wonderful pictures on the next slide? Yeah, should we keep going with the bright colours? So, they, so now we've got more fluorescing organisms. Um, and I'm just going to start, well, I'll pass these out the actually. <laughs> so you can see that we've got, and, and you can see we're, we're in the dark in most of these situations, right? We've got that fungi in the forest there in, in, in the dark, glowing ominously green. And so and apparently this, this bioluminescence, so this is called bioluminescence, there's all, all um, examples of bioluminescence. And apparently this, 
um, is thought to be the origin of the myth of like will-o'-wisps or, or forest fairies. So you can imagine seeing that ghostly green flashing in the forest. Um, there's some glowworms up there. They're from in a cave in New Zealand. And I think so they, they have these mucus strands, which they're catching prey, mm -hmm. attracting prey. That fish, uh, the anglerfish lives again in the deep dark ocean, uh, 300 metres down or more. And it's got a, I don't know, is it the, is that the dorsal? Fin, yes, that, yes, that appendage, fin, yeah. yeah, and then it's got a, some <laughs> symbiotic, um, a colony of symbiotic bioluminescent bacteria that glow in front of it, so it, the, the prey will come to its mouth. And um, and over here, of course, the most famous example, the fireflies, um, and their cousins are click beetles, which are apparently the brightest and bright enough to read by. If you, yeah, there's yeah. one beetle that's extremely bright, one of these click beetles extremely bright um, underneath. The, they have an organ underneath and two, you can see the two on top there near its head. Um, but it's so bright you can read by it. Uh, but apparently if you scare them, they get brighter. So they think it could be a predator avoidance strategy. Um, but also there's different species with slightly different colours, so it could be communication to find, um, find a mate. So the males fly over tops so the females can see the underneath organ and then the females are on the ground and then they can flash and get um, to be like, I'm here, and then the male will come down. Um, yeah, but I watched a video of them and they're quite creepy looking because <laughs> if they're on the ground and it's dark, all you see is those two little glowing spots and they look like little glowing eyes walking around. <laughs> so and presumably this bioluminescence has evolved multiple times in nature, right? Yeah, they, exactly. These don't all have, you know, recent common ancestors, which suggests that it's a really useful thing to have. Yeah, apparently 40 times independently bioluminescence has has evolved, and you might be wondering, well, what what's the, what is the power source here? Because you can see we're, yeah. we're kind of in, in pitch black in most of these situations, um, and so it turns out it's a chemical reaction. So they're, they're, all these organisms are doing a highly highly energetic chemical reaction that releases a lot of energy, um, but that energy is not evolved as heat, but evolved by releasing um, light. And indeed, it's evolved at least forty times. We only know the chemistry of, of a handful of of, of them, and particularly the firefly. We we, um, we know the chemistry very well, but there's certainly a, a huge amount of knowledge still to, to understand. And James, what's the, the picture on the right? Because that doesn't look like a cool That's right. animal. <laughs> Tell us, forensics. Um, yeah, so, so what are the applications for us? So as I said, we, we've worked out the chemistry of how to make that chemiluminescence of the fireflies. Um, well, here's one cool <laughs> application, of course. So, so your glow sticks, you know, when you, when you hear the crack of the glow stick, you're, you're breaking an ampule inside and reactants start to mix together and you, you're generating this chemiluminescence. So this is a synthetic form of that, of that bioluminescence. Um, it's, but it's really important in sensing and assays. So this is a kind of a crime scene investigation example. So if, uh, if you've somehow made a blood stain, don't worry how, and you've, you've cleaned it up, but, uh, but it's really hard to clean up properly. There might be some trace of um, haemoglobin or the iron in your blood. And so you can take chemiluminescent molecules um, spray them on the surface and the iron will catalyze the chemiluminescence. So, so that's the blue glow there. That's what the police will spray and, and they'll see, oh, there was something happened in, in this room. <laughs> Surely we shouldn't go into too much detail about how you know so much about cleaning up um, crime scenes. But, yeah, but it's pretty amazing that something that's, you know, clearly incredibly useful in nature, it wouldn't have evolved independently 40 times, is something that, again, I guess unsurprisingly humans have said, well, this is something that can be really helpful for really us useful, too. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's probably our best way to assay for high energy metabolites in biological systems. So a molecule called ATP, which we use as an energy molecule, mm -hmm. and it tells you about the health and vibrancy of a biological sample. Um, so using this chemiluminescence is, is, is the best way to assay for that. And if you ever get a blood test, usually you get, you know, you get a list of what proteins are high or low in your, in your system. So a lot of those assays would have also involved um, chemiluminescence. Mm -hmm. Can we, can, can I jump to flowers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, pretty flowers. Amanda, what are we looking at? Why are these two pictures the same but different? Same, same but different. Yeah. So on the left, you've got an image as we would see it. Um, so we don't see any patterns really on this flower, just a yellow flower. Uh, but on the right is what a 
B would see. And so bees actually can see UV, so can birds and lots of other animals. And there's these UV patterns uh, on the flower that are invisible to us because we can't see UV, but they're there for a lot of other animals um, and they help the bee find the pollen in the centre of the flower. So there's a function, uh, but it also kind of shows how that we, we have pretty good vision, but there's a lot of things that we still can't see all around us, kind of like a little invisible or secret world. So how widespread, you know, what sort of species have this property being able to see ultraviolet? Lots of species, well. yeah. Mm. Not really mammals, um, but almost every, I think every bird we've looked at can see UV. Insects, it's extremely common to see UV. Crustaceans, um, ooh, there would be, mine's gone a bit blank, but there's <laughs> many, um, Invertebrates, so animals, oh, fish, fish common, can see, commonly can see UV if they're not too deep in the water. If you go too deep in the water, UV light There's doesn't no penetrate. Yeah. Yeah. But coral reef fish near the surface, they can see UV light. So it's probably, it's, we think it's, because we can't see it, we don't think it's that important, but probably <laughs> more animals than not can actually uh, detect UV light. And what were you telling us the other day in our meeting about something to put on windows to deter birds? So there's a, a, a lot of concern about, um, obviously, birds hitting <laughs> windows. And, um, you know, a lot of you have probably got these decals that you can stick on your windows to um, alert birds to, that there is some surface there. But they, a lot of them actually have a significant visual impact on us. You know, we want to be able to see out of our window. So I, I, I think they may actually be commercially available now, but there's certainly people working on um, developing surfaces that are reflective in the UV. Um, we can't see them, but the birds can see them. So it would provide a less uh, visually intrusive um, device that we could use to put on the windows to protect them from birds, you know, protect the birds from um, striking the windows, yeah. Yeah, it's I've, quite got, interesting. I've got some in the lab because it's very hard to add UV to something. There's not many paints with UV and this is the only paint that has UV. So if we're manipulating colours in the lab, we use this So it's paint. actual paint that's designed to put on your windows? So yeah, it birds... comes in like a, a squeezy like... tube with like a foam top. So you just rub it on, but then it, it dries clear because we can't see the UV. And so, yeah, then, Ooh. yep, birds can see it. <laughs> yeah. That is cool. I want some. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking about really beautiful, cool things, I really want to make sure we all get to have a look at this. Yeah. <laughs> how, how I, I, you know, how can something be so unbelievably beautiful and bright? And tell us, talk, talk to me, people. What's going on here? And do they know how beautiful they are? So they don't know how beautiful they are. <laughs> okay, that was a very anthropomorphic question. I guess what I was asking was, can yeah. they see that? <laughs> Uh, they, Do we know? So they can, they'll see in black and white, probably. So they would see this in black and white, but not this beautiful gold coloration. Um, a lot. So the Christmas beetles we have um, at Christmas time, they can't. They most likely can't see colour either. So they can't see their beautiful colours. Um, but it's. It probably had. It would have other functions. So just because they can't see it, it doesn't mean there's not some sort of function. And we're starting to show that actually, even though they're really bright, because you can see how they're flashing and changing colour. So as they move, the flashes. It's kind of like an optical illusion. It makes. It's really hard for your eye to track where it is in its exact position, and predators can't attack them as well. So it actually helps them escape predators while they're in motion. So they look bright and dazzling, and you think they'd attract attention, but they can actually get away, which is, which is pretty cool. And is there a physics take on, on this and how it might work for predator avoidance? Well, I mean, I don't have too much to say about the predator avoidance, but I think there's emerging interest in some of the, you know, multifunctionality that Amanda mentioned about whether, you know, some of the, um, the properties of these surfaces may also have um, uh, thermal properties that may regulate their temperature and also um, their mechanical strength. And so this is an example of, you know, bio-inspiration. What can we learn from, from these, these beetles to help us design new materials? Mm -hmm. And also um, anti-counterfeit and security signatures, mm. if you're talking about mm. going back a little bit to talking about the, the light we can't see in the, in the infrared, for example. Mm. Um, so, and that's where also where we send all our 
light si signals, right? All the light we send down optical fibers is in, in the infrared. Um, so if we can make structures or make similar structures to interact with light, um, we can then think about optical encryption uh, for data security and also just for invisible um, anti-counterfeit signatures mm -hmm. and the like. Mm -hmm. So that's a big area of research of that center of excellence, the Exton Center of Excellence. That we Actually, one thing we haven't touched on yet is how durable these colours are. One of the issues with pigments and dyes is that they tend to fade with time. You only know that you need to leave something out in the sun for a while and it, its colour its color disappears or deteriorates. But these structural colours are, are quite robust. They, uh, as long as the structure, uh, structural integrity remains, the colour will remain. And there are, in fact, fossils that, 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 mm. that of coloured animals that have... Um, they're still coloured today. Wow. And some of these museum specimens yeah, have been collected centuries. Hundreds of years ago, and they still look brand new, bright, dazzling colours, um, and they were collected yeah, centuries ago, and they still look amazing. And the fossils are well worth Googling. There's a lot of beetle ones again, but the colours are so vibrant and iridescent, it's, you wouldn't think that could last in well, a that, fossil. That, that cup, it would be 3,000 years old? Or? Oh, you're less a bit under 2,000, okay. yeah. 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 That's what I was thinking with the cup, yeah. you know, it hasn't faded and presumably it yeah. can never fade unless it's structurally damaged. Yes, I mean, imagine you could melt the particles or do something horrible to them, yeah. but, um, mm. yeah, so it's very robust. So that's one of the, the, the um, attractions of structural colour and coming back to the, the, the beetles and butterflies, um, that they can achieve these colours with these natural materials and so mm. there's a lot of interest in sustainably uh, producing, you know, surface coloration and other, uh, and surfaces with other properties that can uh, utilise something that the animal kingdom has taught us about. You might have heard um, recently there's biodegradable glitter and it's the same idea, it's produced from structural colours now, it's made from cellulose, so from plants, um, but it will degrade, so it's not made from plastic. Uh, so it's becoming, it's much easier to get now, it's becoming pretty popular all different colours, uh, iridescent, changeable colours. So it's a big benefit if we, even, it's just glitter, but if we can make colours and things that are not from chemicals or not from plastic, that's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. And can I jump to your slide while we've still got a little bit of time? Because I want you to explain this to us, please. What is this? So this is um, a, an image that came out of research in my group. It was led by a, a former student and research fellow, Eugene Panchenko. And what this is, is a, a, a colour sensor. Um, you know, and um, Eugene made a number of pixels here. And um, the, the colour image you can see is a microscope image of this, um, of this structure. And I think the whole thing, that whole coloured region, is about the diameter of a hair, you know, so it's very small. And you can see that each of these um, pixels, you can see cyan, magenta and yellow, that's in reflection, so corresponding to, um, you know, the complementary red, green, blue um, passing through into what's underneath. Now, this structure is completely made out of uh, silicon, glass, and um, aluminium, and um, some transparent polymers. So there's no, no pigments or dyes or anything like that here. And so the idea was to come up with a, a, an alternative strategy for producing a colour sensor that doesn't re rely on using uh, filters. Um, and, you know, if you think about a conventional colour camera, uh, the, 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 the silicon that acts as a sensor, it has no ability to discriminate colour. So the way uh, your colour cameras work is that there are various filters that are placed on top of some of the pixels and that um, you know, red, green, blue filters that enable um, a colour image to be produced. But these filters are actually relative, I mean, you may not think they're thick, but they are relatively thick. They're of the order of millimetres thick. But being able to produce colours structurally means that the, the actual um, colour discrimination part of the detector is of the order of 100 nanometres or so. So it's much, much, much smaller. And so the blow up there on the right is actually a scanning electron microscope image showing the, the structures there. And you can see that different structures correspond to the different colours. So again, I guess this is um, you know, now moving into the technology space, how you can take ideas around structural colour and integrate them into uh, new devices. Mm. So would that allow for smaller 
we can start shrinking devices more? Yeah, so you can yeah. make them thinner, uh, but potentially because the uh, conventional colour filters are relatively thick, you can end up with, if the pixels are too small, you can end up with light passing through a filter and hitting the wrong pixel, so it's called crosstalk, so this would uh, minimise that. So these pixels aren't actually that small, but so this was a prototype proof of principle that you could do this. And presumably there's going to be more work because there's just so many important applications of this oh, yeah. sort of technology. Yeah, so this whole idea of, you know, um, being able to use nanostructures to massively miniaturise devices is, it's a key area of, I'm um, involved in a, another centre of excellence in transformative meta-optical systems. And again, this being able to make devices that are much, much smaller, but also can, that can actually, because you can actually manipulate light in really interesting ways once you get down to the nanoscale. You can create um, optical components that just don't um, mimic a conventional um, optical device. It is very, very nearly time that I want to pass to our wonderful audience for you to have the opportunity to ask questions. But there is a little video in our slide deck which I really feel like we should look at, don't you think? I think we should. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So we'll come back to that one. Yeah. But I think we should all look at this just for a moment. <laughs> so should, I'll explain what it's showing here. So I've worked on med shrimp before, but they are the only animals that we know of that can see uh, what's called circularly polarised light. And so that means the waves of light are moving in a circular motion. And so our eyes can detect it, but we can't tell the difference between different types of polarised light, whereas mantis shrimp can and they're the only ones we know of that can. And so this is kind of image on one side is what we might see, but on the other side is the flashing that they might see. And the benefit is they can do this flashing and it's really obvious to each other, but no predator can see it either. So it's a secret communication <laughs> system that they've got going on. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> they have very interesting vision, most complex vision of any animal that we know of. And it sort of connects with a field called Valleytronics, which is, I don't, maybe you can speak to this, yep. Anne, but <laughs> 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 so it, it, it's about, um, let's say, sending communication signals with high density of information. So at, at the moment, maybe, you, you know, you flash a signal and it's on, off, on, off, you can send that signal. But if you, um, Valleytronics is trying to make materials that interact with light to create this circularly polarised light, either left or right. And so you can flash on and off, but also have circularly polarised left or right. Um, degrees of freedom in your information. So then you can send more information per pulse, um, which will hopefully overcome the huge heat problems we're starting to um, come up against in, you know, in our computer processes and, and things. That we've, mm. um, we've kind of stacked as many processes as we can together at this point. So we have to be more efficient perhaps with, our, with getting more information per, per signal. Mm. That's cool. I didn't know about that one. <laughs> There's been several cameras designed based on their vision and circularly polarised light that can help with um, autonomous vehicles. If you incorporate uh, polarised light, you get better um, contrast between, say, a cyclist and the road if it's a foggy condition, so you can pick things up um, from further away. Or there's been a camera design that can detect circularly polarised light and cancerous cells reflect circularly polarised light, but other cells don't. So wow. you can see uh, the edge of the cancerous cell if you're trying to remove it. So there's all these weird applications that you wouldn't ever think of. Um, as you might have gathered, I, I feel like we could keep talking for a really long time, but I feel like that would be rude because I'm fairly confident that some of you are going to have some really interesting questions to ask. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so uh, concise questions will be appreciated so we can get through more of them. So please put your hand up if you would like to ask our wonderful researchers here some questions. Yes, please. Um, with the bioluminescence, are there chemical limitations to the spectrum uh, or can we get like a full range of colours through bioluminescence or, or is there some sort of fundamental chemical limitation as to the types of colours that we can expect? I would say, I wouldn't say there are, there are too many limitations. I don't know if, are there more or less UV pigments compared to red pigments? I'm not sure if there's or, limitations. I just no. know that a lot of them are blue and bluish and greenish, but also a lot of animals can see bluish and greenish mm. light. So there's that kind of yeah. pressure as well. I think famously, yeah, I think the blue coloration is often structural color. Like the, those famous morpho 
butterflies, those beautiful blue butterflies. That is that is pure structural colour. I'm looking at these guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because it, it, I think, yeah, that's right. There's actually, there are fewer blue blue coloured pigments out there, but there's much more red and green, red and green, I think. So when you see structural colour, you've got much more chance. So when you see blue colour, you've got much more chance that it, it's that nanostructured and structural colour rather than a, a pigmentous colour. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Who would like to ask our next question? Um, this is a question for Anne, especially. Um, you mentioned previously with the camera filters that, um, that you had that electron microscopy image up of, of um, each of those pixel filters. Um, notice that a lot of those structures, so like the structural pattern that repeats across each pixel was probably about, I don't know, 10 or 20 repetitions per pixel. Is that a limit to miniaturizing this sort of technology? Um, we believe that the um, structures could be reduced a little bit more. Um, uh, when we're thinking about these, this, this, this sort of falls into the category of meta optics where you've got these, these thin layers of nanostructures. Uh, they tend to be in some sort of repeating pattern. So you create this effective medium, if you like, or effective surface. And so the question then is, how much of it do you need for it to actually do the job? I think, and, and, and it comes down to how important is the coupling between um, the individual elements. If, if, if we're relying on just a single element behaving like itself, that would enable massive miniaturization. But if the technique relies on having a number of them coupling together, um, I did some work a few years ago um, in collaboration with um, someone who's now in engineering, and he was looking at making structural colours, and he was trying to figure out how many elements in the, in the structure he needed to be able to produce the given colour. And I think he, he only had a few. So, um, you know, that would mean that you could potentially get down to, easily get down to a few microns or smaller. But yeah, no, it's a very good question and really it comes down to the, the physics of what's going on in those individual elements, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for the question. Who would like to be next? Moira, over to you. Thank you. James, can you give a bit more information about how this can be used to make solar cells more uh, efficient? I mean, the current technology is okay. You know, yep. what kind of you know, efficiency are we getting currently? What would revolutionise the field? And does this kind of chemistry have a role to play in it? Yeah, actually, I may have a slide for that. Where's their bribery here? <laughs> so just on this slide, on, 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 the, on your right-hand side there, so you can see that picture there, we've got a a green laser shining into a solution with a particular chemical in there. And you see that chemical starts to luminesce blue. Um, and so I wonder if you, do you think there's something wrong with that picture? Is there something wrong with that? Clearly AI. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that, that's a little strange, right? Because blue light um, is actually higher in energy than green light. So how on earth are we, are we shining green light on that, that material, that molecule, and we're getting blue light out? Are we, um, and the answer is we're doing something called energy up conversion. So effectively you take two units or two what we call photons or two units of energy of green light, um, they get absorbed by the molecule or it's typically actually a polymer. So you get a couple of excitations on the polymer strand and then they come together and essentially fuse together and form one photon of a higher energy. So that's why you see the, the higher energy blue photon coming out. Um, and so in terms of making our solar cells better, and it links back a bit to the, the near infrared story we were talking about, the light that you don't see. Unfortunately, silicon also doesn't see a lot of the infrared light. Um, and that makes up a, a really significant fraction, 30 or 40% of the sun's light falls in, in, the, in the infrared and our silicon solar cells don't harvest it. So um, we're, we're looking to, to develop those kind of um, chemical materials which can take in, two infrared photons, which are really low in energy, um, get them to fuse together to form a visible photon and then that visible photon can be collected by the silicon solar cell. So that's kind of, in that sense, it's, it's augmenting a silicon solar cell to make it better. Yeah. Um, in terms of efficiencies, I think uh, some te techniques along those lines can get us up to maybe 50% efficiency, whereas at the moment a single silicon solar cell is sort of high 20s, is approaching 30%. So that's a big mm. difference. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 any, yeah, even a, a percent or two would you know, revolutionise yeah, solar, solar harvesting. Yeah. Mm. But the question is, you know, are they stable enough? You know, can we couple them to the cells and yeah, lots of challenges, yeah. 
Thanks, Moira. Who would like to ask our next question? Yes, thank you. Well, could one of the panels say something on how animals produce these structural colours? As I understand, it's a lot of um, intricate, um, um, very small structures repeated a vast number of times. How do they do it? Looking at you, Amanda. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not my expertise, but I know that it's a it's a, um, a pretty young field, so we don't actually know that much. Um, so if you think of butterflies or beetles, like butterflies um, have a cocoon, a chrysalis, and so something's going on in there with when they're manu uh, developing the structural colours. Beetles do the same thing, a pupa. And so there's labs really trying to work out um, how these structures are being assembled during these pupa or the pupa or chrysalis. Um, but as far as I know, it's still pretty young field and we don't know exactly how, we're, how they are assembling um, these structures. But there's a lot of potential. Like once we find that out, there's a lot of potential for bio-inspiration from that as well. I don't know if you know any more on... <laughs> I don't know any more, but I know that a lot of people are very interested in being able to replicate that um, self-assembly process. Yes, yep. Fantastic. I think we can do another question. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Yes, in the middle. Thank you. Yep. Hi, I'm just curious. You were talking about how there are 40 different kinds of bioluminescent animals and they've all evolved separately, but it uses a high amount of energy to make that light. Are some animals more energy efficient with the light they're creating than others? Oh, cool question. Good question. <laughs> yeah. We're looking. I'm not sure about that. I th a lot of the ones I know about produce it all in a very similar way with luciferase and luciferin and it's the combination of the two that produces the Flash. That's right. There's, yeah, yeah, chemical so there's a, and an enzyme. But they're typically, or for different species, they that. So the luciferin is a general term for the you know, the, the power molecule. Let's yeah. call it. <laughs> <And> luciferase <laughs> yeah. is the enzyme that, that causes that reaction to happen. Um, so they are different. But it, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know which ones would be are more efficient than others, um, except to say that that click beetle was apparently the brightest. Yeah. I'm so, not sure of what's going on in the background yeah. of if they would be more efficient or not, or mm. if it's all just a similar thing and um, they just make use of what they, what they can, what they've evolved to do, but that's a similar e amount of energy required. I'm not sure, actually. Very yeah. good question. Yeah. That's the beauty of science, right? Often the answer is we're not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just before we finish, team, I'd really love to hear from each of you. And I should say first, thank you so much for the wonderful questions. Um, but, yeah, I'm just interested. You know, you're all obviously really passionate about this and it's wonderful to hear the, the um, collaboration that's going on across fields when we, when we talk about these fundamental things like colour and light and energy. But what's the future of your work in this area? What are you excited about? And you only get about a minute each, sorry. But tell us, where, where are you heading with, with your research in these areas? Amanda. Uh, so at the moment, I'm really interested in, uh, so we're talking about moving animals and predators can't attack the moving animals as easily. But we don't really know what a lot of these animals are seeing and how they're perceiving these colours. So my work's really trying to work out exactly how animals are perceiving some dynamic, changeable colours, how that affects the function, and then linking that in with um, some collaborators at other organisations where that could improve sensor design or image processing algorithms. So if these animals are processing visual scenes in different ways, it could be more efficient than what we're doing. And so then we could apply some of what we learn from how animals process the scene to improve our uh, technology as well. Mm, exciting. Thank you, Amanda. and. I guess there's a couple of things here. Firstly, I've got an active collaboration with um, some of Amanda's colleagues, bioscientists, looking at um, some of the multifunctional properties of beetles, so that's very exciting. But also I'm very interested in um, this area of meta-optics, which is looking at light-matter interactions on the nanoscale and trying to be able to you know, not just um, uh, create devices that produce ultra-compact versions of things like lenses, 
uh, but also sort of really unusual devices that um, can do things that uh, a conventional optical element can't do. So one of the things working on at the moment is uh, a device that could do real-time image processing, for example, but taking ideas around light and uh, nanostructures. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. That's exciting. James, what are you excited about? And for me, I'm really all about um, materials for solar energy harvesting. Um, so I think, honestly, that, that up conversion story I already got to tell you about, that's really exciting just because we are so wasteful in our society of heat. You know, we, we, an incredible amount of our energy use is all about generating and manipulating heat. Um, we don't do it very well. As I said, we don't capture with our solar cells, you know, 30 or 40% of the solar spectrum. So that direction for me, I think, is, is really impactful one and really where I, I would like to, to go in the future. Yeah. And I have to ask, what sort of time scale are we talking about for more efficient solar cells? I know it's a million dollar question. But... End, of, end of the next research grant. Is <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone's got a bit of cash lying around and would like to support James's work, I'm sure he wouldn't say no. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope we'd make incremental advances. Um, and it's all, actually there's a lot of work in, in making solar cells for different environments now. For example, um, in, in this centre of excellence I've mentioned before, we're looking at solar energy in, in space. So, you know, when you've got solar cells, now we're putting many more satellites and things up there, um, but it's, it's a much more difficult environment in terms of being bombarded by high energy particles. So how does a solar cell um, survive up there? So lot, lots of different areas as well we can, mm. we can look at improving. Yeah. But hopefully bit by bit. Bit by bit, yeah. it's the only way. Yeah. <laughs> um, could everyone please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers this evening. I really hope, like me, you will all go out into the world now and just see things a little bit differently and perhaps ponder you know, the animals that are seeing the worlds differently to us and, and, you know, how things have evolved and all of the bio-inspiration and how we've managed to learn from this, you know, these incredible things going on in nature and apply them to all sorts of wonderful things in, in medicine, in technology, in, in, you know, in solar cells. I think it's pretty remarkable. So I hope you enjoyed this evening's conversation as much as I did. And it's an uh, absolute thrilling, really thrilling to us that you've come out and joined us after so many years of online events. It really is wonderful to be back in person again. So thank you for coming out this evening. We'd love you to join us in the foyer for more interesting conversations. Uh, there are drinks, there are snacks. Please stick around and chat with us. Don't forget to check out Amanda's earrings. <laughs> and uh, I'd just like to thank all of you for coming so much. Have a lovely evening.